no mansion, got no yacht. Still, I'm happy with what I've got. I she was called the Blonde Blitz on Hollywood's golden age of moving musicals, among them Annie Get Your Gun. At her peak, Betty made 20 movies and $9 million. But when Hollywood was preempted by television in the mid-50s, her career came to an end. She tried TV in Las Vegas. It didn't work. Then came divorce, pills, alcohol, and a suicide attempt. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Today, Betty Hutton is back on top and in the limelight. Not in Hollywood's terms, but on her own terms. After a rocky climb back to self-respect, Betty has settled in Newport, Rhode Island. Here she is the official greeter at the High Life Sports Center welcoming the fans. The people love it. That acceptance, plus the help of a local priest and conversion to Catholicism, have helped Betty carve a new life. Thank you very much. Betty. Hi. How are you? Good luck tonight. Okay. You put your life back together again. Yes, I did. With and the help of many, many people, though. Father McGuire never lost faith in me, Pat. I, when I didn't think I could make it. And lots of the people did. He said she will. He had run across a book I had been writing since I was about nine years old. It was called Backstage You Can Have. And in there was the depth of me that I never was uh, really free to tell people the way I felt about God and about life. And when he read that, he said, Betty, you never show people this side of you. I said, I'm afraid to let anyone see any side of me except the real happy, go lucky side, which is not all of it. You know, that was how I became famous. But trying to be that happy, go lucky person so many years was very, very difficult. You know, very difficult. It's a fantasy world. And yes, it is. And did you get caught up in the fantasy? Very definitely. And when I started to take pills to keep going, you know, my life was in a nightmare at that time because the marriages crashed and. I didn't know how to handle everything. I wasn't prepared to handle the advent of the great thing of television, the picture business being really on its way out, you know. I didn't know where to turn. It's the only business I knew. And I was terribly frightened that I, I wasn't in anymore. I just wasn't in. And when you're not in in Hollywood, you don't have any friends. I literally don't have any friends out there. And people say to me, do you miss your friends in Hollywood? I have to honestly say, I don't have any. I never had any. You have friends while you're making a picture and while you're making it. But when they say no and the contract's over, even the cops on the gate say hello, hi, Betty, a little differently. There's an edge to everything. I'll never forget that last day on the set. Everybody is just a little bit different towards you. And see, a lot of people can get cold about that. I broke down over it. I couldn't handle it. It hurt me so, you know. All these years later, are you bitter about it? Not a bit. No, no. If I took time to be bitter. Oh, no. I was. Those five years of getting well was all that. Bitterness, hatred, that no one understood. Well, how could they understand me when I didn't? You know, it was no one's fault, Pat. It was just, I was in a world, I came from great poverty, and I became rich very fast, and I did not know how to handle it. I didn't have close friends, and I didn't have Father McGuire to help me. But see, Father said that's where it was supposed to be. Now I can help people in trouble because I've been through it. And God tried me and tested me, and thank God to be in New England with these kind of strong people. Inside, are you different? Is there a different Betty Hutton? I think so. I feel different. I'm a whole new person. I am not frightened anymore. I have the normal nervousness before working at night, you know, but not that god-awful fear, what if they don't like me? You know, that's a living nightmare, to live through that all those years, that curtain going up and wondering what's going to happen, and oh my god, bring the curtain down fast if something goes wrong, you know. It's awfully hectic. Anyone who doesn't think that show people earn their, uh, their living are crazy. I mean, what you do, you know it's horrendous, the hours, the preparing all your st everybody's got to be in a great mood if one person goofs it's over the people out front are the first to know you're just not making it they never know why they just know something's gone wrong you know this this thing that you live with all those years will they like me will they like me yes why did you want them to like you because i was never loved as a child you see i was a bastard child and that's a very lonely situation to be in. And I was, my mother was very ill from the time I was a little girl, and I had to bring her up. I never had a home. So from the time my mother was a bootlegger, so from the time I was three, I was singing and dancing and taking care of my mother. 
nobody took care of us. I, they were always hauling me before a judge, going to take me away from my mother, and I'd fight, you know, to stay with her, and that was my life. So what did I have to find? I had to find mass acceptance. It wasn't just acceptance, mass acceptance. That's what performers demand and need, because they, somewhere in their background, they didn't get it. That's why you are a performer. You need to hear this so loud. Applause, applause. Yeah. And then it's over. And then what? You know, if you don't have God, which I didn't have, where do you turn? So every night was empty for me when it was over. I said to my mother, what's wrong? Why am I so miserable when that curtain comes down? And my mother didn't know. I didn't know. Marriage would fix it. Children, nothing fixed it. I think the hardest thing is that you cannot be, uh, you can't have a family. You should never be married and have a family in that mad town. It doesn't work. My children suffered. They were jealous of me. And uh, the marriage is, uh, it's very difficult to be married to someone who is a superstar. You know, it's really hard for the kids. They're not like the other kids. And no matter how hard you try and make that work, and most mothers, you know, that mo uh, they don't work. Their, their kids just don't come out right. How many marriages so, did you have? Four. Four? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Each one worse than the one before because I didn't know what I was doing. But I was trying, you know, but I, that's a world I really don't understand. So I'm never going to try that again. Yeah, you would but I, oh, I adore my children. I don't see my children. We've had a, a, an estrangement for a long time. My older girls, I, mean, I have six grandchildren who I've never seen. And that breaks my heart. I'd love to see them, you know, maybe someday. During your career, you earned about $9 million. Where did it go? It went to people, you know, bankrupt marriages and, and uh, in trying to buy happiness. And I, you can't do it. You know, I would do anything. If I could have bought it, I would have. It was the only way I knew how. You know, if somebody wanted a Cadillac or a fur coat, fine, if they'd love me and be kind to me, you know. But it doesn't work out, Pat. What was your last movie? Um, let's see, The Greatest Show on Earth. Somebody Loves Me was the last one that I did, the one you remember, The Greatest Show on Earth. Yeah. And Annie yeah. were the last two big ones. Yeah. yeah, and then Somebody Loves Me. Right. And and somewhere around there, the, the, it was if the fellow you were married to wanted to direct your next movies. Yeah. And uh, you, you quit over that. You yeah. you walked out kind of on Hollywood right. at that point. Right. Was that the reason you walked out, or did you have an inkling this isn't for me? Anymore? No, it just things weren't going. The mar that was a problem too. Is each husband seemed to want something that I couldn't deliver. Like he wanted to be a director, and I was trying to make him one. But see, that then hurt my work because that's very bad to walk in and say I want my husband to direct, or I want my husband to coach, or what the heck ever. But in, now you're pressured in the marriage. He's mad unless you help him, and that's happened. In my last marriage to Pete Condola, he wanted to conduct on the stage for me. This is a bad number. You know, not, but he's not great. It just doesn't work. I have to be alone when I'm working. There's no one can share that particular spotlight with me. I don't I mean you can't have other people. I'm just saying no, you, I in understand. your family, you that's just right. you can't have someone else in that that riding car. your way. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And do you regret going to bat for him now? Do you think if you had oh, to? No, it, wasn't, it was a very bad idea then, and I told him so. It doesn't work. It didn't work for our marriage, and the marriage was destroyed. What he didn't like was that I, when he married me, I was a star, and within a couple of years, I wasn't, and he didn't like that. And, you know, so that's okay. It's groovy. They marry you because you're a star, and then I guess when you lose that image, you, you aren't the thing that they fell in love with. Don't you see? They didn't fall in love with me, the me you're talking to. That's right. They fell and in love with the lottery, eight and a half right, by 11 glossy photo. Right, right. And they can't be faulted for that because they do see all this. And all of a sudden, I, I really fully realized, now, I don't think I knew who the hell I was anymore. It really gets confusing, the part you play and, and all the attention you get. And I made 100000 a week in Vegas. and. You know, it's, it was phenomenal kind of money. It blows your mind what goes on. And then this little person when it shows up was standing there saying, oh, my God, where did everybody go every night? Terrified inside of me. It's every night that I was the big star. I was just that scared inside.